Okay, so let's get started. Sorry for the mess of the last few weeks, it was a bit chaotic uh, due to me being away, me getting sick, and so on and so on. But now let's, let's see if we can continue. Today's topic uh, is augmented reality. Uh, first of all, the, the usual organizational stuff. Um, so I've shifted everything by one week so we can still fit everything in the semester. The, the only change is basically that we will still have one uh, more lecture on July 13th. That's the last one of the semester. I was usually uh, planning to, to just leave that out, but now we can just do the exam preparation here. And the exam itself will now be on July 27th. I already mentioned that, 10 o'clock in Kudrechstrasse. Um, okay, so now let's look into augmented reality for a bit. We already have a lecture um, about virtual reality, so I won't go into too much detail here. The uh, important difference, I guess, is that we're looking at mobile stuff here, and if you have virtual reality, then you can't really be mobile out and about because you would fall over something pretty quickly. So originally the idea of augmented reality comes from this uh, so-called Milgram continuum, which is um, somewhere uh, on, on the one extreme we have the real environment, and on the, the other side we have a completely virtual environment, and somewhere in between we have a wide range of different types of mixed reality. And um, um, the, the rough difference of what type of mixed reality we're looking at is, is categorized by how much real content do we have and how much virtual content do we have. And of course, if we're looking at entirely virtual reality, then we have 100% virtual content. If you look at the real world, then we have 100% real content. And anything in between is mixed reality, basically. Um, so, uh, the, the agreed upon definition for any kind of augmented or mixed reality currently is that I have some yeah, mixture, of course, of both types of information. I can interact with the virtual information in real time. And most importantly, the, um, the real and virtual uh, objects are actually aligned with each other. So uh, that some virtual object is actually spatially connected to something in the real world. So I need some kind of visual input and output, uh, especially output, of course. Um, for interaction, I need some kind of, of tracking or, uh, or input device, at least. And very important, I need uh, six degrees of freedom head tracking so I can actually make the alignment. So I need to know where the user is relative to the real world and especially where the viewpoint of the user is so that I can then render the virtual graphics in such a way that they look spatially aligned. So um, let's maybe look at an example. This this augmented reality, apart from the fact that it's completely overdone. So if you, look, if you think about the, the definitions I just um, mentioned, is this augmented reality or not? What would you say? Yeah? Mm, no, because it's just presented on the screen and doesn't have any real uh, connection to the outside. Uh, true, true for most of them. There is one example where it actually is augmented reality, and this, that's this one. Because it's connected to that car, it's maybe a little difficult to see. The rest of it is just a um, big, big piece of information overload. But um, this one, and maybe also some of these, um, these advertisements off to the side, are um, kind of uh, augmented reality. Um, so you have the ability to interact with it. It says here, uh, look at target and blink rapidly to install. So um, you have some kind of interaction, even if it's not a very, uh, very good form of interaction. You have spatial alignment. 
and um, you have a mix of real and virtual information. So in the widest sense, this is augmented reality, but of course it's a, uh, it's a very, very, very overloaded form of uh, augmented reality. Um, so let's see. So actually, the idea of augmented reality or virtual reality is quite old. There's a novel from 1901 where the concept is mentioned for the first time. Um, the first head-mounted display is also nearly 50 years old by now. This was called uh, Sword of Damocles, you can see it here. So you had this huge contraption you had to put on your head and it was actually connected to the ceiling because it was too heavy to, to actually wear it for, for any long uh, time periods and you needed all the cables. And so it was called the Sword of Damocles because uh, if at any point it would have come down from, from the ceiling, it would probably have killed the guy standing in the um, And uh, 12 years later, Steve Mann started to build the very first actually wearable head-mounted displays. So Steve Mann is one of the pioneers. Uh, he's still building these kind of displays. By now, they don't really look much different than, than regular glasses. But the, the first prototypes look a little more bulky, uh, but still they were already wearable um, and you know, just, just for one eye may, uh, and probably monochrome, but still it's, it was a very early prototype. This was almost uh, 40 years ago by now. Um, so now let's look at a bit of a fundamental technical difference if you want to have any kind of head-mounted display, because you want a mix of real and virtual world, so how do you get the mix? And uh, there's two fundamental types of head-mounted displays, so to say. The first ones are optical see-through displays, where you have some kind of optics, which combines the light coming in from the real world and the light coming from some kind of display, and both uh, combined uh, light sources are then uh, directed to your eye. And of course you need some kind of, of head tracking, which we already talked about, so you can actually make the alignment between uh, real and virtual content. Um, so what's, what are the advantages? Um, you get a direct view of the real world, so you don't uh, have anything which, which basically obstructs your view. And you can, uh, your eye can actually focus on things in the real world as it's used to. So that uh, we, we already talked about this for a bit. Um, that's a big problem in virtual reality sometimes that your eye doesn't actually focus on the distance where you expect things to be, but on the distance of the display. And uh, if you have a um, optical see-through display, then you can actually focus on whatever there is in the real world. Um, problem here is you can't really um, you can't really put anything virtual in front of a real object because the light from the real world will basically just shine through so you can just overlay it but you can't really cover anything so you will always see a bit of real world through your virtual content and uh, that doesn't really help with the idea of, of making it seem real. So the virtual content will always be quite recognizable and if you have a very bright environment then your display may even be simply too dim to, to provide enough light so that you can still see the difference. So then the virtual content will just, just vanish. Um, and what's also a problem here is if you move your head quickly, we already talked about this too, this may also be a problem, um, it will become far more difficult to, uh, to keep the virtual content properly aligned because um, you see the real world directly of course and uh, so the virtual content can maybe only have at most 10 milliseconds of, of lag behind otherwise you will immediately notice and also if the tracking doesn't properly work and stuff maybe starts to jitter a little or something then you will also notice immediately. So these are the difficulties here. Um, on the other hand, 
other big option is called video see-through. So here you don't really see the uh, real world anymore. You just see the display, just as in virtual reality. But you also have, um, you have additional cameras on top of your, uh, your head-mounted display, which are then uh, the data from these cameras is mixed with the 3D data and then shown on the display. So you're still seeing the real world, but you're seeing it through uh, a pair of primaries. And one of the big problems here, which you can already see, is of course that now uh, the point where you actually view the world from, which is the, uh, the center of the camera, the optical center, is different than the one you're used to, which is the, the optical center of your eye. So if you move your head, then the cameras will move slightly different than what you're used to. And that will, of course, then also again uh, uh, bring problems. Um, the advantage here is that you can immediately use the data from these cameras for tracking. So you can directly recognize objects in the camera screen and align them to the image data and that will uh, will of course give you a better alignment than when you try to, to put the data directly on top of the virtual world. And you can also render over um, on, on top of the real world and really hide things or, or swap them out. Um, one problem here again is just as with virtual uh, displays, we already talked about the parallax, you also again have a single focus distance, so you just focus on the display and not on things somewhere in, up, uh, at the back of the room, which will then start to, to confuse your eyes again. Um, can you think of any other problem with this kind of um, um, video see-through? If you're actually, since we're talking about mobile systems, when you're actually moving around in the real world, what kind of problem um, um, can you think of when you use this kind of system? Yeah? Tracking could be hard because of different uh, lighting. Hmm? lighting. Tracking is hard because of different lighting. Oh, okay, of different lighting, yeah, outside. Okay, well, that's of course, a, that's always an issue, yes? Yeah, also for the user motion sickness, if there's some lag in the between the image yeah. the user mm -hmm. you can see and... That's true, even if it's properly aligned. So if you turn your head and the image takes half a second to turn with you, then you will all get sick really fast, probably. Yeah, and I think the field of view or the peripheral vision might not be absolutely mm -hmm. possible with the camera. Yeah, that's also a good point. The field of view is probably different from what you're used to. Yeah. I think it will be a distorted perception of the distance. Yes, that's that's kind of related to the field yeah. of view, I think, yes, the distance perception will be different. Um, there's a lot of processing involved, so it will drain the battery really fast. Yeah, that's, uh, it's, it's processing intensive, that's true, and since you mentioned the battery, for example, what will happen if you're just crossing the street with something like this and the battery runs out? What happens? You don't see anything at all anymore. So you, you're in that situation, you just can take off the, the goggles. And you always need uh, some external device for tracking, like you have to determine your position in the room, such that um, and there's always this sensor orientation in this uh, agent. Yeah, well, that's, that's maybe not 100% <coughs> necessary. We'll talk about this in a, in a bit, uh, what different options are there to actually determine the position. So, of course, it works better when you have external sensors, but there's also the, um, the option to actually use the, the camera, simply the cameras directly for tracking. You can also try to do that. Um, okay, so now let's look at what you can actually get. Um, so, in terms of optical see-through, there are, I think, two main uh, contenders right now. There's the Microsoft HoloLens, you've heard about that maybe, that's an entirely self-contained set of goggles, which here you can see they have this kind of semi-transparent shape in front of the eyes, but you can still see the real world. And there's also the meta glasses, which look quite interesting, which are similar to the HoloLens. 
um, but a more open platform, and which also claim to have a very, very large field of view, which would of course be nice to have. The HoloLens actually just has, I think, 20 or 30 degrees, so that's like having this kind of screen in front of you, so there's only a really small window in which you can actually see any uh, virtual content. Um, so a lot of the, the promotion videos for the HoloLens are, in my opinion, kind of misleading because you get the impression that the entire room around you is like decorated with, with virtual objects which are really large, uh, for example, but you can actually just see a small, small uh, window into that virtual world with the HoloLens. Um, I've listed Google Glass here because it's an optical see-through head mount display, but it's not augmented reality. Do you, can you think of why? Why is Google Glass not AR? Yeah. Maybe like on the picture you showed before in the car, mm -hmm. like Google Glass is just um, displays information, mm -hmm. but it's not connected to the exactly. Computer. Exactly. Google Glass also has a very small window. It's just like, like holding a smartphone at, at arm's length, maybe. And in that window, it can display information, but it's simply too small to actually uh, align that information anywhere in the, in the real world. Um, yeah, okay, so these are commercial, commercially available optical see through systems. Um, of course, in terms of video see through, um, there have been different systems uh, been built by people, so you can have something like uh, uh, Google Cardboard or simply those goggles where you put uh, your, um, your smartphone into and they usually have a, an opening for the camera. So you can also somehow use camera data from the real world. This is of course a, a low-end solution and the big problem here is that you only get one single camera. And so it's only a flat image uh, on which you can, can put some kind of information, but it, if you look at it with both eyes, then it still feels like, uh, like just a flat, a flat pane, basically. Um, some people have uh, built add-ons for the Oculus Rift, where you can actually have two cameras, one in front of each eye, but um, this gets quite complicated quite quickly because you need to synchronize the cameras so that the... Uh, there isn't a difference in, in time. There isn't a time delay between the eyes. That would also be again something that would make people people sick very fast. Um, so there's right now, as far as I know, uh, you can't really get any uh, proper video see-through um, uh, head-mounted display uh, off the shelf. Just about anything is either a very low end solution with, with just the smartphone camera or it's something very complex and custom built on top of maybe the Oculus Rift or something. Yeah? The HTC Vive has a camera in front. Does it have one or two? Just one. Okay. Okay. Well, that's better than nothing. I think that's so you can basically walk around the room if you want to, I don't know, drink something or something like that, but it's still not stereo, so it will look, still look like, like uh, basically like a painting because it's, it, it doesn't have, have any depth information, but good to know. Um, okay, so we already talked about this uh, mostly, just to summarize what are the issues with h and uh, especially if you're outdoors, then it will be difficult to actually get the virtual content bright enough so you can see it. The field of view is a lot less than what humans are used to, so actually it's almost 180 degrees for, for normally sighted humans, but many HMDs just have 20 or 30 degrees. Um, then of course you need to deal with the weight. Um, if it's more than 500 gram or something, then it will al already start to become uh, uncomfortable on your head after some time. Um, you need to deal with lag and there's also the, the safety issue we, we already mentioned. Um, okay, so I think that's mostly for HMDs. Are there uh, any questions up to here anymore? <coughs> Okay, 
guys so much for head mounted displays. Then there's a different class of displays which is heads up displays. Most of you have already seen this. If you're driving in a, in a maybe a little more expensive car, then most of them already have this kind of heads up display where you can where you get like your speed and the next the next turn you have to take and so on directly in the windshield. Um, this is not, in this case, it's again not really augmented reality because it's not spatially aligned. It's just some information in front of your, or in front of your nose somewhere in the air. Um, there has been some research, for example, which tries to, um, to make the navigational arrows uh, look like the arrows on the road so that they're basically flat on the road and show you exactly what turn to take. Then it starts to become augmented reality, but that's also a lot more difficult because then you know, need to know exactly where the head of the, um, of the user is so that it actually fits on the road. Um, usually these systems use some, also some kind of beam combiner like the optical see-through um, head mounted displays. Uh, and in the easiest case, it's simply the windshield itself. And if the, the angle from the, from the light coming from the display is adjusted just right, then it will be reflected off the windshield and you can, you can see it. Um, if you have, uh, especially in, in a military context for aircraft, for example, um, then there the pilots will often wear some kind of, of instrumented helmet anyway. And then you can tell where the head of the pilot is quite exactly. And then you can also do stuff like this, where the information is now actually augmented reality because now it's spatially aligned. So for example, the horizon is uh, aligned with the, with the real horizon. Um, and that just wor only works if you exactly know where the, where the head and the eyes of the, of the pilot are. Um, uh, and that's mostly the reason why it's, uh, this is only be done in only done in aircraft uh, and not so much in cars because in cars it's a lot more difficult to actually uh, tell exactly where the head of the of the driver is and where where they are looking. 